Uh, the question I pose for the whole talk is economic liberation or, in fact, 21st century serfdom. And the last point that you raised about is it exploitative because it, people are sort of almost forced to engage in this and sell their, you know, rent out their, their stuff in order to make ends meet? Um, or or is, it, is it, as the technology companies that are engaged in this like to put it, it's a great new opportunity for people to be entrepreneurial and run their own small businesses and to earn some extra money on the side that they wouldn't otherwise earn. Um, and, you know, it, it's a great facilitator for, you know, proper community building and sharing and all the rest of it. So which of it is, is it? Let, well, I think we're going to run through some arguments on both sides that other people have said. You've, you've given me views here, which have been really good. Um, and first, in the spirit of definitions, I just thought I'd uh, remind ourselves what a serf is. Uh, a, a person in a condition of servitude, uh, required to render services to a lord. So I don't think there are any lords of the sharing economy. Uh, or to a slave. But the, po the point is, um, a condition of servitude. I think this is quite interesting, as we'll see later on. Um, now, I'm not concluding, by the way. I'm not sort of taking a pro or anti the sharing economy. I think what this exploration about, as you saw, it's quite woolly, I think, at the moment, as to what it means. And there's good in it, and there's, there's worrying stuff in it. You've given me a list of both. Um, so let, let's dig into it. Let's explore this a bit more. So first of all, the people promoting the sharing economy, peers.org. Peers is an industry body. It's been set up by the big Silicon Valley tech companies, the Airbnbs, to promote the sharing economy. So obviously they're coming from an angle. They say sharing creates new value, giving us more flexibility and extra income. That's that entrepreneurial story. Uh, consuming directly from people we trust is more affordable, more social and less, less wasteful. Fantastic. So they've got the environmental efficiency, they've got the uh, quality of relationships with the people that you're sort of sharing with, um, and that it's lower cost, so it's driving down the costs of, say, taxi rides or staying in a particular part of the world. You can probably rent an Airbnb room much cheaper than you'd rent a hotel room, so all these benefits. So that's fantastic. What's not to like? Um, here is, in fact, the, uh, one of the founders of Peers.com, Douglas Atkin, who's also the head of community at Airbnb, a corporation who has a head of community. Um, I personally want to see the sharing economy grow to become the dominant global economic model in the world because of the social and economic benefits which are built in, not because my stock options will go up in value, because of the distributed wealth control and power which it represents. So this is great. This is a promise of distributed wealth control and power. Well, we'd all sort of like to see a bit of that, I imagine. Uh, Matthew Hancock, the Business and Enterprise Minister, so he launched uh, at the end of last month the consultation that the Department of Business is currently undergoing. And he says there's huge, or a civil servant wrote for him, there's huge economic potential for the sharing economy, and I want to make sure the UK is front and centre of that, competing with San Francisco to be the home of these young tech startups. So, hmm, San Francisco or Shoreditch? Uh, <laughs> Uh, now, Time Magazine, collaborative consumption is one of the 10 ideas that will change the world. Time Magazine, not known for hyperbole, so that, that's, that certainly means something there. Uh, now, some of the negatives. This is my favourite, actually, that I've found so far. Uh, Eugenie Morozov is an author of The Net Delusion, The Dark Side of Internet Freedom. He says it's neoliberalism on steroids. Oh, that's quite a different view, isn't it, to those first ones, which was all very cuddly and lovely, and that's what he thinks. Um, Tom Slee is another author of No One Makes You Shop at Walmart, The Surprising Deception of Individual Choice. This is quite a long quote, but I think this is quite important. The ultimate endpoint of capitalism in which we are all reduced to temporary labourers and expected to smile about it because we're not interested in, because we are interested in the experience, not the money. The sharing economy, we're in it because it's a pro-social thing to do, right? Jobs become extra money, just like women's jobs used to be extra money. <laughs> and like those jobs, they don't come with things like insurance protection, job security benefits, none of that old economy stuff. So he's obviously a bit of a cynic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> speaks for itself. Uh, now, now this, is, this, is, this is an interesting one. There's been some investigative journalists that have gone and talked to Uber particularly is a, is, is a ride sharing, as they like to call it. Other people might just say it's a taxi company. They call it ride sharing. Um, uh, and, and this would, obviously is not named because of fear of retribution. Uh, and this is what one of their drivers said. Okay, it's one person's view, but there have been a number of these sorts of views that have been expressed to journalists. Uber's like an exploiting pimp. Now, this is one of the 
the word exploitation came up earlier. It was amongst the concerns that you had in, in the discussion here. They take 20% of my earnings and they treat me like shit. They cut prices whenever they want. No distributed power and control there. Notice the prices are set by Uber, not by the taxi driver. Um, they can deactivate me whenever they, whenever they feel like it. Uh, everybody is rated. Uh, you rate the, the Uber driver after you've taken a ride, uh, not five stars. If the average drops below 4.7, then they're delisted and then they can no longer make any money. Um, and if I complain, they tell me to F off. Obviously, I've, uh, because you're, you're sensitive people, I've deleted the Anglo-Saxon uh, rest of that word. Now, um, now that is, is obviously painting a very dark picture of where this can go. And this is supposed to be one of the shiny examples of the sharing economy. So as you can see, this is very contested. Um, that Uber driver reminded me of the birth of the trade union movement in, in the UK. It reminded me of the Dockers. It reminded me of this picture. This, from the late 19th century, are labourers turning up every morning at the docks in London, but also in Liverpool and all the major ports in this country, because they were employed not even by the day, but for the shift of unloading uh, a ship. And they didn't know when they turned up in the morning whether they would return home at night with enough money to feed their family. Now that was, and this is 100,000 odd Dockers living in this uh, uncertain world. Um, this is one of the reasons that led, these were unskilled labourers, there were already trade unions for skilled professions, but these are unskilled, supposedly labourers. They organised and they won uh, employment rights and some sort of security so that they knew what their income was going to be, health and safety, all the rest of it. The birth of the trade union movement, or one of the drivers of the trade union movement in the UK. And this is a quote from uh, Ben Tillett, who was a, a union uh, leader uh, in a book that described... Um, the condition prior to the union organising. We're driven into a shed iron barred from end to end, outside of which a foreman or contractor walks up and down with the air of a dealer in a cattle market, picking and choosing from a crowd of men who in their eagerness to obtain employment trample each other underfoot and where like beasts they fight for the chance of a day's work. Now what worries me, that's a hundred years ago, is how similar it is to that. Now, uh, now, this is not to condemn the sharing economy, but this is trying to identify what are the elements that are included, uh, this sort of co-option of the term, under this nice-sounding word, sharing economy, that has lots of positives that you talked about that we don't like, and, and try to identify what that is. Um, so there has been this backlash. So I've picked out two, the two, two big companies, Airbnb and Uber again. So um, the New York State Attorney uh, General... Uh, has just recently released a report. They examined Airbnb and they concluded that 72% of the rentals that took place were in violation of New York state laws and regulations. Now, those are there to protect the safety of individuals who stay in rented space. Um, there, was one, uh, there was one participant there who had made several million dollars. So this is not somebody letting out their spare room. This is a serial landlord that is using, that is jumping on you know, a platform to really just carry on an existing practice, but cloaked, one might say, in the uh, rather more attractive clothing of the sharing economy. Now, I'm sure B&B &B would sort of contest that characterization, but equally they might say, well, those sorts of guys aren't the ones we want on the platform, so maybe they need to think about that and work out what its purpose is. Uh, but certainly it's an issue, and um, the interesting thing about Airbnb and this quality of relationships, I mean, we use, I, I've used Airbnb, don't get me wrong, but I, I just think it's a commercial company like any other. I mean, I don't see it as some great pro-social movement. And yeah, okay, if you, if you stay or if you let your house out or your room out, then you're going to chat to the person who stays in it. But I don't know, has, have any of you stayed in a normal b and and not conversed with the owner? Yeah? I mean, how different is this really? Is it new? Um, taxis. Has anybody taken a black cab in London and not had a deep philosophical conversation with a taxi driver? Because it's impossible. I mean, the idea that, that the new sharing economy that Lyft and Uber all of a sudden are turning and blah, blah car, which is named uh, particularly about this whole point that you chat and have a nice quality social interaction as you're getting your Lyft. I don't know. You know, I mean, I was used to chat to taxi drivers. I don't know what the big deal is. So I don't know. I'm a bit sceptical about that. Now, Uber in particular has run into some trouble. Um, Uber drivers are starting to organise. Now, these uh, sharing Silicon Valley sharing economy companies don't like 
their um, partners, the entrepreneur business uh, owners that they work with, because they can't call them employees because they'd have to pay tax and do all sorts of inconvenient things like giving them labour rights. They call them partners. They don't like them organising, but they are organising. Uh, and there was a point where they all, um, and I think it was in New York, um, oh no it wasn't, it was, it was in California, where they all switched off. And a number of drivers organised and they all took themselves off the platform for a period of time and nobody could actually get an Uber taxi. Um, and, and in certain places, in certain places in Canada, it is banned and it's banned in Germany because they just see this as, okay, well, we, we, we currently have taxi drivers and they're regulated and we make sure that people are safe if they get that taxi and we know that they're you know, insured properly and their cars are maintained properly and there are all sorts of regulation around it. And instead, we now have unregulated, unlicensed taxi drivers running a taxi service. It's not the sharing economy, it's just undercutting. Uh, and getting rid of labour rights. Now, I think at its worst, at its worst, for my money, this is what is happening. Now, that's not to say that, that therefore, the sharing economy is, is bogus, because it's not. But around, there are edges, and these, certainly the Uber thing, I think, are edges, where this is just a company that's trying to find a way around. It's just offering a taxi. It's a taxi company. They reject that. They call themselves uh, lift sharing, you know, drive sh ride sharing. Uh, but they're, they're a taxi company that doesn't want to pay its workers properly. And I think that's, pretty, for my mind, that's pretty clear. Um, well, so this is me now, obviously, expressing my opinion. Um, now, this is my list, or indeed ones from people I, I, um, I read. It's, it's, it's different from the list you came up, which is great, so we've now got a longer list. Um, but here are, the, here are the pros and cons. Uh, now, we've run through some of these. Opportunity to run your own small business. Well, I, I think the taxi one is a bit dubious, but there are others where you can set your own prices so Etsy, where you know, people have a platform to, to sell their own craft products, that's, you know, that's giving them customers that they couldn't possibly get, get to before. So, I mean, this is providing opportunities. Um, you know, but on the other side of that, at its worst, it's just insecure, precarious work. It's back to the dockers queuing up every morning, not knowing whether they're going to get paid. Innovation in business models? Well, yeah, this is really cool. Somebody mentioned earlier on that you know, um, in, in Freecycle, you've got stuff that you know somebody's going to have a use for, because of the internet, you're going to find the person who's got a use for it in a way that if you just posted up something in your local post office or even a classified ad in a local paper, the chances of finding that person were much lower. So this is great. Innovation using the technology, matching unmet needs with spare resources. Uh, as Jonathan will say, that's sort of a key part of what we see the money system as being for, indeed the exchange system. So that's good. But if what that really means is that you're just finding a, a way around regulations to, to compete with existing firms without having to pay taxes or comply with regulations, then is it innovation in a business model or is it, is it a way, is it innovation in avoiding uh, you know, uh, regulations and, and competing unfairly? Social revolution? Well, I think all of the examples you gave personally of engaging in the sharing economy were all ones that didn't really depend on this, this new, there actually were some that did, that were definitely internet enabled, but a lot of this activity this is just stuff that's always been happening. Okay, well that's great. So, you know, all that says is we just need to push back a bit on the co-option of this term as being something to do with just technology and something that somebody's invented and written a book about and become famous about, right? This is just sharing is something that's always happened. And, you know, let, let's just remember that. So there's not, maybe there's not too much new about it. Better use of resources? Well, yes. Um, you can certainly see that ride sharing, for example, takes cars off the road. That's brilliant. There's the opportunity. But if you look again, I'm going to pick on Airbnb again. If you look on their, uh, on their website, what it is basically doing, this is a travel company that is promoting to you the idea of, oh, why don't you go to Morocco? Look at all the places we've got available. Why don't you travel here? It's a travel company promoting travel. This is just promoting new ways to consume more. So, you know, it could be either of these things. It could be environmentally beneficial because we're using those spare resources. Uh, I don't need to buy a drill because I know that I can, there's somebody on the street who's got a drill and when I need to drill a hole, I'll use that drill. Huge reduction in the drill production globally. Fantastic. But then in other cases, it might just be me encouraging it's a new way to consume. I'm going to consume more. Could be either, couldn't it? Um, finally, social and economic liberation. Well, um, now this is interesting. Repeating existing patterns of privilege and hierarchy. You remember the slide I showed you of who's using it? White, middle class, middle aged uh, professionals um, in employment are the people who are most going into the digital version of the sharing economy. 
Um, there's also, I mean, I haven't been able to verify this, there's no statistics, but one of the commentators said the people who perform best in terms of their lettings on Airbnb are white women and the people who perform worst are black men. So, you know, are we just, we have to be conscious, I think, with the sharing economy that we don't allow existing patterns of prejudice or privilege and hierarchy to just be repeated online because that's not a social advance. Now, that, I mean, again, I'm not saying necessarily that this has gone either way, but these are, I think, important considerations in how the sharing economy should develop. There's quite a lot on this, but I'm going to make one really important point. This is from the Friends of the Earth report that I mentioned, and I think it's really interesting because they talked about the different the sharing landscape they talk, we, we can share things, we can share services, we can share experiences, that's a very useful classification. But what's more interesting is that they talk about individual, uh, collective, uh, so for example, um, you know, credit unions, cooperatives would be in the collective, sports clubs, tool banks, collective, individual where one-on-one -on -one is swapping and bartering, ride sharing, but public, they point out that we've had a sharing economy for quite a long time and particularly after the Second World War in this country, and it's called, the pub, it's called public services. Things that are collectively provided because that's the most effective way to provide them. Libraries, uh, health services, uh, politics and public spaces. So, um, you know, that should be considered part of the sharing economy, and that's quite interesting because the dynamic that might say that uh, the rise of the internet-enabled sharing economy run by all these private businesses means that we can withdraw lots of sort of public provision is a false dichotomy. I mean, it needs to be across all those spaces. So I think that uh, just to sort of reach to the, the end of, of my kind of conclusions about it really, I think the important thing about the sharing economy is to ask the right questions. So, uh, and any particular example of it or company or, or practice, is it promoting consumption? or is it actually genuinely finding us new ways to reduce our uh, footprint on the planet? Does it increase or does it harm social equity? I mean, it might be that it, it, it's increasing it, but uh, I would say that the sort of precarious employment position of Uber taxi drivers is not doing much for social equity. And certainly when you see that this is another way in which people can become enormously rich by investing in and being the startup entrepreneurs of tech companies, that's just, again, increasing inequality. Does it reinforce the profit motive or altruism? This was uh, raised by, by one of you earlier on. I mean, if, is this another way we're monetizing something that was already happening and commodifying it? And actually, is that pushing out the, 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 imp the impulse that we all have to give, to quite simply the gift economy, to, to actually allow, to see the people around us provided for out of um, altruism? Uh, Power, where does the power really sit? Well, I think there are examples where it is empowering for the individual that is participating. But to go back to poor old Uber, who I am giving it in, in the neck to, um, clearly their drivers are disempowered. They cannot control the rates. A lot of them went out and bought cars. Initially, the rates were really high. You could make good money, better than being a regular taxi driver. They went and bought cars. They didn't and so that they could be Uber taxi drivers. Now the rates are cut so low that even if they're doing 15 or more hours a day, they can't make enough money to keep that car on the road. Hey? There's no power. There is no equalization of power going on there. That's reinforcing existing power. So what's the ownership and governance is really, is really important. Uh, for my mind, I'm suspicious of anything that's driven by private equity entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley because I don't really see how that can truly lead us to a sharing economy. If it's a cooperative model, if it is collectively owned, if it is collectively governed even, if not owned, then I think, okay, that's a little bit more comfortable. I, th I see more p sharing of power and spreading of power and economic uh, empowerment particularly. Does it reinforce private property or the commons? Which brings me on um, to uh, something that Jonathan introduced at the beginning. You're going you're to hear David Bollio speak as a big expert on the commons. I think this is possibly, for, for me, it gets to the key. Is it reinforcing private property or is it enabling a new economy of the commons. Where, what, do, what do we want the sharing economy to be? This is Michelle Bowens, who runs the PTP Foundation. He's a great writer about the commons. And this is the way that he categorizes it. And this, I think, uh, is the penultimate slide. But I think that this is a really interesting way of thinking about it. Because he says, you can divide up these new sharing economy uh, activities and companies into ones which are centralized and ones which are distributed. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, you can see whether they're part of the existing capitalist, private capital, private ownership system, or whether they are part of the commons. 
So the capital centralized ones like Facebook, um, he calls that net article capitalism, right? It's just a different form of capitalism. The value is captured by the owners of the capital. Uh, this, is, this is really what he's arguing is where, is where you get serfdom. <laughs> the actual the power is still centralized. Uber sets the rates. Um, the money is all made by the people who control that network, not the people who are in it. They're just 21st century serfs, one might argue. There's distributed. So Bitcoin is interesting because that's a genuine peer-to-peer -peer activity. I don't, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Bitcoin, but there is no central control of it. The, it is, it is the, the control of it is distributed. So that's, you know, that seems to be more empowering. But the thing about Bitcoin is that people are in it to make money. It's utterly driven by a profit motive. And that's all. Now you might say, well, that's fine of itself. But do I therefore consider it part of something called the sharing economy? I'm not so sure. I'm really interested in the ones on the right, as is Michel Bowens, which is the commons. So uh, he, he talks about global, uh, centralized uh, exp you know, examples of this, and Wikipedia is itself. Wikispeed, if you haven't heard of it, was where um, 80 people came together from 12 countries, three months in an online uh, collaboration to design a car. And they achieved that, and the car was way more effective than anything being made by Toyota and existing car companies. And his argument for this is that if you design for the commons uh, rather than for private profit, you will design something that will last, because that's your incentive. You'll design for longevity. Private capital designs for obsolescence, because it needs to sell you a new one in three years' time. And the incentives are completely different. So this is very interesting, and that's a very interesting shared economy space. Uh, and then finally, the distributed power and part of the commons is where, you know, Reconomy is playing, I would suggest, where the transition movement, where other social movements are uh, trying to experiment with, can we really distribute power um, to, 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 to the local groups, to the community? Um, and can we use technology? Can we capture all of the good things about this? Can we sort of, can we, can we use all these new business models, the new technology to let us do more of that, to take more power into our communities, to actually have something that's a real part of the commons, a real, real shared uh, community economy. Um, well, let's hope we can. So I think, you know, capitalism versus the commons might well be one of the most important questions to ask when we're looking at things that are being called, or call themselves, part of the sharing economy. And, uh, and just to drive that home, somebody mentioned earlier on, Transition Town Totnes Garden Share. Very interesting story that, as you know, gave rise to Hugh Ferning Whittingstall's uh, land share, which also attempted to connect people with gardens that they couldn't handle to people who didn't have a garden and wanted to grow. No money's changing hands. This is just, this is, this is really part of the sharing economy. Um, that was an example that was cited by Rachel Botsman in her TED talk and in her book about the, of what collaborative consumption looks like. But how on earth did we get from that to Uber? <laughs> right? Well, I mean, we don't have to go from that to Uber. Um, we know what the sharing economy looks like, and that's the part that we should be trying to encourage. And the really, really free market is a great um, a sort of uh, movement in the States which gets together, and it's a sort of just a physical, it's a free cycle with a picnic. You know, people just bring stuff they're willing to give away. We had that, yeah. um, Did you? Yeah, community, um, community potluck suppers yeah, by. And did you call it the really, really free market? Was it transition town? No. 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 You did have a really free market. Okay. To sort of conclude, this is this is my Nesta. Right, this is my. This is how we kind of like. There's the missing bit on the end, right? Which is now what I'm going to put forward to you. This is a list of traits uh, of of a sharing economy from the Nesta report. So the Nesta is the big ex experts in this. I have added some words which I think would make it traits of a healthy sharing economy. So they say the first trait is it's enabled by internet technologies. And I'm saying, but not exclusive to digital. Yeah, because sharing can take place without digital. You know, it's all very nice and shiny to have smartphones, but we mustn't exclude the non-digital. They say connecting distributed networks of people and or assets. I say in equal power relationships. Right? That is, I think, an essential condition of what a sharing economy really looks like. Thirdly, to make use of the idling capacity of tangible and intangible assets, this is the efficient resource use, great, without encouraging the acquisition of new assets to share. That's just a business. That's the old economy. Uh, but there's nothing really inherent that sort of is, presenting, is preventing that. 
Encouraging meaningful interactions in trust? Well, I'm kind of slightly... I think that would be a good... I agree that they should have that con condition in there, but I'm just not sure that many of the things that are called sharing economy companies are really doing that. So we have to ask ourselves, well, how? How is that encouraging meaningful interactions in trust? And finally, they say, which I think is really good, that it's embracing openness, inclusivity, and the commons. And just to ram that home, I say not entrenching private capital accumulation. And if, it's, if it doesn't meet that test, I don't want to call it part of the sharing economy. I just think that's part of the old economy. And that's fine if you want to go and make money. Don't dress yourself in, in, the, in the cuddly clothes of a social movement. You're just a business making money. That's all. So let's have a discussion. Thank you very much.